Good morning, everybody. Uh, <coughs> we start now this uh, webinar about uh, gender issues by Professor Elcida Francesco from uh, uh, University of Naples Orientale. Uh, the title of the presentation you see it uh, on the screen, uh, Gender and Economics in North Africa, Discrimination and Access to Employment for Female Workers. This is uh, um, one of four seminars which we are going to deliver this month about uh, gender issues. So, um, Professor Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raniero. Um, first of all, of, um, I want to thank uh, Unimed, in particular uh, Marco Di Donato and Raniero Kelly for inviting me in this webinar. Uh, just a few words for um, just we got about the agenda. We will have a first introductory section um, with presentation of agenda and the general presentation. Then we have a longer section about female labor market in North Africa. And I will try to illustrate the patriarchal gender norms and parading, and parading which influence uh, women's uh, participation or, or women employment, women unemployment. And, and so on. And we will also speak about the women's unemployment rate. Uh, then we will have a, a Q&I participant, um, Q&I session, eventually a short break. And then we go on with, with the third section that will be about North African women and Lord labor market. And in this section, we will speak about a labor market in, in North Africa and about wor workplace discrimination against women. Again, we, we will have a Q&A uh, section, and then the, the last section of this uh, webinar, uh, which will be on the role of microcredit in creating new opportunities for North African women. And I will try to present uh, two case studies. And then we have a final conclusion and final Q&A sec section. Okay, let's go on. Let's go on. Just a general overview about the situation of, uh, of women in North Africa. In the MENA region, the gender gap has narrowed in the field of education, health care, but it remains unchanged in the economic and political, political arenas. North African women face several difficulties in entering the job market, but at the same time, they are experiencing new opportunities and are proving to be able to exercise greater impact on the economic and social political situation in the regions. Various strategies have been put in place to foster improvement on women's participation in the labor market and to promote development, especially in the rural areas. Among the most important strategies we can mention microcredit and microfinance, um, which are both a little bit, as you know, a little bit debated. There are, there are um, several, several limitations, but nonetheless, they can have an impact on female empowerment. Um, let's switch now to a general overview of two uh, important uh, matters influencing the women, women's life in North Africa. First is healthcare, and second one is education. As far as uh, healthcare, we, 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 can, we can say that in the last, in the last decades, uh, the MENA region has made a remarkable, remarkable progress towards um, improvement of women's rights. The rate of maternal and child mortality have decreased dramatically, meeting the objective of the UN Millennium Goals with regard to improving maternal health and reducing child mortality. Um, another very important um, goal achieved is the, the reduction of the fertility rate in the region. As you can see in this slide, uh, the, um, starting from uh, starting from the, the 80s to the to the 2000, we, we can see a dramatic decrease in fertility rate, um, going from about uh, six seven children uh, per woman to about 
two, three children per woman. This, this line, this, this horizontal line is the world, uh, the world average fertility rate. And as you can see, some of the um, MENA region counties are below this rate. And this is a big achievement uh, in the region. And, uh, and uh, which has a big impact, for example, on the possibility of women to access uh, um, job market, uh, to the reduction of the number of, or to the, to the reduction of the family, reduction of ch uh, children care works, and so on. This is a, we can say one of the best achievement in in the region. In the region, going on and uh, switching to education. Uh, what we can see about this is that uh, the uh, women in North Africa and the MENA region have made significant uh, progress in education. In particular, in the 2000, the MENA region succeeded in bringing the ratio of girls to boys in primary and secondary education up to 0 0.96, and in significantly increasing the ratio of young women attending university. Nonetheless, women still constitute the least educated segment of the population in several, uh, in, in several regions in, in, um, in MENA counties, in particular in the rural regions. For, for instance, uh, in Morocco, 35% uh, of women above uh, 15 years of age are still illiterate with the majority of them concentrated in countries, rural areas. The advancement, uh, the advancement, so, so you, yeah, sorry, we, we, yeah, we, you can see the rising female and male literacy rate in the MENA region from the 70s to the 2000s. So you, you can, you, as you can see, uh, also comparing to other middle income countries, the MENA region has, uh, has done an incredible progress in the in the rate of female male um, female male uh, participation in the education. Thus, as I've already said, uh, reducing the gap between me, between men and women in uh, in education. Uh, nonetheless, it is one of the biggest problem in the region. Uh, the advancement of women in terms of literacy and in reducing uh, fertility and in general in a better uh, in a better access to to health care have not have not been translated into a more effective inclusion of women in the economic and uh, political uh, political arena across the MENA region in particular the fact of education of the female labor market participation are not straightforward. A basic education has a moderate positive effect, while a tertiary education has no effect at all. This phenomenon, which is um, often referred to, um, is called a gender paradox. You can see for example, the World Bank uh, uh, 20, uh, the, the, uh, the World Bank report uh, issued in 2004 and again issued in uh, 2000 uh, to, in 2012 about uh, gender paradox and gender paradigm in the in the MENA region. Gender paradox is mainly due to the patriarchal culture that dominates the region. Moreover, a discriminatory legal and fiscal framework and the lack of public structure for the care of children and elderly both reinforce the gender-based division of labor and perpetuate the dominance of family center of centering around the male breadwinner. Finally, the early mandatory retirement age set at 50, 55 years um, for the women, exclude a significant share of them from the labor market. So, as we can we can see, there are several several reasons um, behind be, um, um, behind this lack of participation or the scarce participation of women in labor force in North Africa, not only 
gender norms uh, linking to Islam or linking to a patriarchal society, but also a non-women-friendly a non, a non, a non -women uh, fiscal framework, lack of, of public structure, and a non-women-friendly fiscal, no, fiscal norms and uh, norms by, about uh, retirement. Uh, as you can see in uh, in this slide, in, in, in this slide, in both uh, the Arab states and North Africa, the, fem the female to male employment ratio is lower than the average than, than every ratio in other emerging countries. Um, in particular. Um, in, uh, in particular, women's employment in non-agricultural sector is weak compared to other regions in the world. Moreover, the proportion of women employed in the industrial sector dropped significantly between 2000 and 2011. Women, and in particular young women, and as well as youth in general, are more exposed than their male counterpart to unemployment underemployment and or and or informal employment uh, now i will show you uh, some slides about the about the main sector of female employment in the mina in the mina countries uh, here we have oh, sorry uh, here we have the public sector uh, from the 80s to 2000 uh, public sector has a crucial import, a, cru a crucial part, a crucial role in women's in women's employment because uh, because state was for a long time, especially after indep the independence, uh, state was for a long time um, the the better the better way for the women to find a, for, to find a good a decent job. Uh, the cut. In the public administration and the cut in, in in public sector in general, starting with the structural reform in the 90s, which accelerated in the in the in the 2000s, have dramatically cut the possibility for women to access to a public employment, thus uh, forcing the women to move to the private sector, which is not women friendly, or more and more to the informal and. Uh, an underpaid um, uh, sector. Here we, we can see a slide of the paid private, so the formal private sector uh, employment. Uh, in, in the, in the, um, you, you can see uh, women, the percentage of women and male employment in the private sector, is, and you can see that uh, that with some with few exceptions the percentage of women in, in the private sector is lower than the percentage of, of men. So that's, that's, that means that women have less possibility than men to be employed in the private sector. Uh, moving more, here we have the no, informal employment, and here we have a comparison between some uh, between a MENA region, some countries in the MENA region, and other regions in, in, uh, in the world. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the percentage of informal uh, or the informal, the percentage of women in the informal sector is quite high, and, and and we excluded in this in this um, slide the agricultural sector because in the agriculture the percentage of women is higher, much higher than the percentage of of men. Uh, here I show you some picture about underpaid uh, underpaid sector uh, which employed mainly women so we have we are right here we have uh, moroccan women working in manufacturing section uh, then uh, women again a call center in morocco call center developed a lot uh, in both morocco and tunisia because uh, they can employ young people, educated young people, young people who are, who are fluent in, 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 uh, in French. So this call center can uh, be very, 
uh, useful for, for France, for example, and for other countries in Europe. And normally people are really packed in this call, in this call center. Here, this picture show a, a quite good situation, but the situation can be, the work situation can be really uh, much, much worse. Uh, and here uh, below, we are women, women, Morocco and Tunisian women working in agriculture. Uh, so here we have tomato and strawberry and um, women are employed in, uh, in agriculture. They are normally underpaid. Um, we can have both family, uh, family farm uh, where women start working when they are very, very young and they work until they are old. Although we have this intensive agriculture where women are uh, employed and underpaid and this agriculture is mainly uh, mainly for uh, for export to Europe. Uh, and so actually, we benefit of this work in terms that we have we can find in our supermarket uh, low cost tomato or low cost strawberry. But we have we, we must be uh, also uh, conscious that buying uh, um, low cost tomatoes or low cost strawberry coming from North Africa we are actually spoiling uh, with also women's work. Uh, let's, uh, let's move to the, to the next, uh, let's move to the next uh, slide and next slide show the trend in the, the trends in rates of labor force participation and unemployment by sex from 2009 to 2021. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the rate of uh, women employment in uh, um, in North Africa and as well in Arab states is much lower comparing other region in the world and the, comparing also the rate of uh, developing countries emerge in emerging countries. On the other side, as we can see, the the rate of women unemployment. Um, is is much higher than um, is much higher in North African and in uh, in the Arab sta states than than in in other region of the world. Um, so the gap uh, between men and women, uh, as far as employment, um, is higher in North Africa and in the Arab states. So we can say we can say in the MENA region in general, than in other uh, than in other uh, region all over the world and sometimes the the rate of unemployment we, here we have for example a rate of 19.5 percent in north africa and of 16.3 percent in arab state uh, can be much higher uh, for example in the rural areas or among young uh, young women and we can have in some cases, especially after the 2000, uh, 2010, 2011 uh, revolution, and now after the pandemic crisis, we can have a much higher, um, much higher rate of women employment, um, reaching also 40, 45%. So a really high unemployment rate uh, among, among women. Um, another phenomenon that we can register in the in MENA region and uh, is a phenomenon which share both uh, women, young women in particular, and young men is what we, we this is the so called weight unemployment. Uh, that means uh, people, especially young people, just waiting for. Uh, for, for employment in the public sector. Um, the public sector job still remain the most sought after form of employment as they are much better uh, compensated than equivalent private sector position, in particular for the highly educated. That's why we have pe young people just waiting for, for a job in a public, in a public sector. Uh, this waiting, this waiting, uh, this waiting uh, generation uh, is a, is a big problem in the MENA region, uh, as well as 
in sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. Mean waiting generation, as I, as I said, uh, means just young people uh, waiting for a, for a job in the public sector or the job in a formal sector in, in, in general. And they are, they are just waiting. They cannot marry, they cannot uh, have a house, they cannot rent a flat and so on. And that is a big social problem um, in, in, in the region. Going on, uh, and just uh, some uh, figures about uh, the recent situation, and I, um, um, as recent situation, I mean the situation after the, the so-called Arab Spring. So you can see in, in, the, in this line um, in, in, that in two, thousand, in two countries, uh, Egypt and Tunisia, which, which were both involved in the, in the Arab Spring, we have, uh, we have a women unemployment uh, which rate with, uh, which is double than uh, men's un unemployment rate. Uh, in, in Tunisia, we have uh, unemployment rate for graduate women as high as uh, uh, 49.4 percent, comparing to 21 uh, percent of unemployment about, uh, among their male fellow, uh, they, 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 they male fellow, they, sorry, they say, um, a mistake here, they male fellows. Um, so as I, as I already told, there is, uh, there is um, the problem of women's unemployment is one, uh, one of the main problem the region, the region has to face in this, in this year. Um, okay, here, uh, yeah, now I've concluded the first, uh, the first part, the introductory, the introduction of my, um, of my uh, presentation. Um, I don't know how we can go on. Uh, do you have a question, Marco or Raniero? No, I don't have questions. Uh, um, just a technical point. You should yes. please go back, uh, Doris Tornare, to participants. Uh. Okay. E vedi se e, e darmi di nuovo la, la host come hai fatto prima. Ok, aspetta. Dice, do we have questions? Our participant. Not yet. <laughs> okay. ok. Welcome to the, to the webinar. Welcome, the welcome. Good morning, thank you. Good morning. I hope it's clear the presentation. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. I, I... Ok. Understanding everything. <laughs> okay, thank you. If you have a question, you can interrupt me. Don't, don't, any, with no problem. Uh, ho fatto, Raniero, credo. Bene, grazie. Perfetto, grazie. Uh, Thais, would you like to take this opportunity to introduce yourself to tell Professor? Okay, yes, thanks. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I'm sorry, my, my camera is not working today. <laughs> Uh, I'm a PhD student. Um, I'm doing it in change in UCN, Madrid, and uh, I'm participating of the, the raised group uh, because Tamara is my, my teacher. So I'm, <laughs> I'm participating on the, those formations to understand a, a little bit more about the uh, about gender and my migration, because uh, in my thesis I I study gender also, but uh, uh, specifically uh, of a group in Brazil. Mm -hmm. In Brazil. <laughs> oh, many friends. So uh, you are based in in Brazil, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I'm here, yeah, I'm here in Spain just for no, Spain. six okay. months. I'm here in Spain for six months, but I live in Brazil. Yeah. Okay. That's nice. Okay. I'm not going to deal uh, with uh, with migration issues, but it's actually fundamental issues uh, considering uh, women um, access to work. And but I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not considered this issue in my in my presentation. But if you need some help in finding uh, readings, I'm, I will be very happy to 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 help you. Yeah. No. So, no problem. It's okay. But it's good to. To know more about it. <laughs> okay. Okay. If you also have a general question about the women's situation in MENA region and in North Africa in particular, 
uh, please do not hesitate just to ask me. I have a question on- Oh yes, please, Marco. By looking at that. Uh, the statistics showed here refers to 2012 and uh, our, the, the year just- You mean this, you mean this, yeah. this slide? The slides, the present yeah. slide, okay. Yeah, the, the slides you have. What about the situation after, let's say, uh, nine years? And what about your perception of the same statistics in the, in the after the, 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 let's say, at least in Tunisia, the removal of, uh, uh, of Ben Ali? And uh, uh, also what about in Egypt after this, this slide it changed the head at the level of, of government? Are the statistics uh, benefited from the so-called Arab Spring or the unrest uh, didn't touch the, this kind of, uh, uh, of statistics and the situation worsened in some cases. Because for example, for Tunisia, we have for sure uh, an economic crisis, which is very deep. Uh, so I would like to know from you if after six years, seven years, eight years, the statistics uh, worsened or remain stable or uh, hopefully get better. Uh, I mean, do you mean statistics in, in, in the field of work? Yes, in the field of women unemployment, yes. In the field of work with unemployment, the statistics are um, more or less the same. Okay. And even worse in some cases. For example, we do, still don't have statistics uh, in, uh, for the 2000 uh, after the, the pandemic. Okay. Because the, pandem the pandemic uh, dramatically uh, touched the informal sector. And the unemployment in the informal sector is, is, is worsening. And, and as, as you know, a lot of women work in the informal sector. So a lot of women have, have been touched by the pandemic in terms of, uh, of work, in terms of unemployment. But we still don't have statistic for okay. the last year. But considering consider the nine year after, after the um, Arab Spring, after the, the, uh, the revolution in the, in the, in the region, um, depending on the country, in country like Egypt and Tunisia, which are both experienced a very, a very a terrible, a terrible uh, economic crisis, crisis this, this, the situation of women in terms of work is, is, is getting worse and worse. So the unemployment rate uh, is, is, is still increasing because some sector, like for example, tourism, uh, Tourism is, is, had a, had a terrible a terrible crisis in in both countries. Mm -hmm. and a lot of women worked in, in, in this sector. All this sector linked to tourism. Um, and that's one that's one problem. In Morocco, uh, due to the stability in, in the country, the situation is, is better. But the, the women mainly uh, find work in a very vulnerable sector, mm -hmm. like, for example, services, manufacturing, the so-called free zones, okay. which employed a lot of young women. But the, the, the work conditions are not the best you can have. So they are more, in general, generally speaking, um, the situation is quite different, depends, of course. Mm, but in gen generally speaking, uh, even if we have a better rate of women employed, for example, in Morocco, the uh, statistics are better. But if we, if we look at the kind of work the women uh, can access to, we find that more, in gen general speaking, is, no, is informal and underpaid uh, work, especially in the in the free, the so-called free zone in, in manufacturing. Uh, as um, several, um, several, uh, several films, several European films have delocated in, in Morocco, for example. Right. They, they, of course, they, they employ women. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, the, um, the fish production in, on, on the coast, on Morocco coast, for example, for the export. Uh, th these films employ them. Sometimes are delocated, uh, and they employ women. Uh, but the work the work condition are um, are bad. I mean, women are underpaid. They have to work for a long for a long for um, for many hours, uh, at least eight nine hours. Uh, they don't have a formal uh, work contract. Mm -hmm. And so the, the possibility to be the possibility to be hired with no reason 
uh, is quite high. So I cannot see that after even uh, just to 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 ask to answer your question in two words. Uh, in two words, I think uh, that in general the unemployment is growing. Mm -hmm. And even in case where unemployment is not growing, the city, the work city, the work condition for women are, not, are are getting worse. Okay, very very good point. Thank you very much. This is uh, also it also helps to understand. And what I think um, it's very. Uh, let's say strange, but strange is not the the, 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 the most appropriate word, is that the, this, this, the unemployment situation among uh, young, uh, young, young, young people, it's a youth in general, and especially, especially young, uh, uh, young women, was mainly, was mainly due to the structural reform in the MENA, in the MENA region, uh, starting in the 90s and going on in the, in the 2000s. And this is this situation of unemployment, underemployment, the general frustration is one of the reasons behind the revolt. But nonetheless, now the solution which the the, the institution like, like World Bank, uh, uh, um, um, FMI, and, and 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 so on are are proposing, are suggesting to getting out from the, the economic crisis are again, 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 neoliberal solution, uh, concentrating on private, on, on private sector, on cut in the public sector, mm -hmm. um, and on, uh, on, on, on direct foreign, for, uh, foreign investment in, 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 the, in the country and so on. Actually the same solution in the, in the, in the period of a structural reform, in the main, the, the, the same solution which caused the, the, the this big un, this high unemployment and caused also the, the frustration and the revolt. So right. there's no, no new ideas. Some new ideas were developed in Tunisia just after the, the revolution, but the I mean the problem of the, the foreign debts. Uh, in the in the council is so is so big problem that the council have no actually no space no room no space at all for developing developing any other solution than those mm -hmm. suggested by the international institution. Um, Celia, sorry. That's the big. That's the biggest problem. Can yeah. I ask you a nasty question? Yes. Uh, this data that you are showing on this uh, on this slide, in particular for Egypt. Mm -hmm. How how reliable do you think? How realistic do you think they are? I mean, 9.1 uh, unemployment rate for men looks very very good. It's better than what we have in Italy, <laughs> and I doubt that the situation in Egypt is really like that. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I will agree, agree with you. There's a big problem with data. This is one of the biggest methodological problem. Uh, people, who, the people who want the biggest methodological problem dealing with data in the MENA region in general, because it's quite difficult to access to non-official data, uh, and uh, or there are no non-official data, and the official data try to low the percentage of unemployment. Of so we, what we can see that this percentage is. I mean, let's say that it's a trend, but we, if we want to, we, we want to think in, uh, uh, in real, uh, in, in, to think about the real uh, figures, we have at least double these, yeah. these, um, these figures, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, that's, why, that's a big problem. Um, um, access to, to reliable data is a really big problem. But I think it's it's a more a political problem. Than that's a, a poli uh, yeah, yes, for sure. That's a political problem. Countries try to uh, to reduce the problem, uh, not showing the problem they have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I think you can go, go on. Thank you very much. Okay, I go on with the second part. That is uh, the second part. That is North African women and the labor market and uh, workplace discrimination against women. 
Okay, uh, North Africa uh, region remains a traditional society uh, which generally prioritizes, uh, prioritizes women's role within household. Uh, such patriarchal elements are not unique to the region, but are perhaps more pronounced here than elsewhere. Uh, however, these elements are being affected by ongoing transformation, uh, uh, education uh, spread, as I have already, uh, already mentioned, demographic, dem demographic balance shift, uh, younger and more educated uh, women uh, who are uh, who, who, who are not who don't want um, accept to accept the housewife stereotypes and so on. Um, the same the same applies also to the women's participation in the political uh, in the political arena. So women in general, women in North Africa are. Uh, are showing a greater confidence in, in their ability to contribute to the public sphere. Uh, none, nonetheless, uh, moving to the labor market, women are still are facing uh, several forms of discrimination, uh, <clears throat> which are exacer exacerbated by the present economic situation. First, they, are, they experience an inequality in the workplace. Uh, most uh, North African countries have, have laws against discrimination in the workplace and legislation mandating equal pay for equal work. In practice, however, enforcing non-discrimination laws is difficult. Equal, equal pay provisions are undermined by inequalities in non-wage benefits, which are usually allocated to uh, to men and thus to husbands in, in general. Uh, many women, for example, cannot benefit from proper labor legislation as they are employed in, uh, in the informal sector, as I mentioned, mainly, mainly domestic or agricultural labor, which offer less protection than normal unemployment contracts. This lack of protection leaves such women vulnerable to exploitation and unfair employment practices. Um, we have also in some countries, for example, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, legis legislation penalizing sexual harassment in workplace. Uh, they encourage victims of sexual harassment to report instances of illegal conduct. However, as in many other countries, there are significant barriers against the effective enforcement of such laws. Legal claims against the harassers are difficult to pursue and are rarely an option for women who are afraid of being blamed or marginalized by their communities. As far as the point two, uh, the expansion of public sector mainly in the 60s and in the 70s, create many uh, jobs, especially for well-educated. Women have benefited uh, directly from this job, which they often perceived as socially acceptable and compatible with family, care, and housework. But the high level of public sector employment has distorted the labor market by attracting the brightest, the brightest workers at rates of pay that private sector cannot match. Additionally, generous, generous subsidies and family benefits certainly have helped to reduce economic vulnerability and poverty, but have worked also to reinforce the vision, the vision of women as homemakers and discouraged them from entering the labor market. As far as point three, a, set, uh, a central tenant of social contract have been heavy state investment in education. And this, high, this, high, this heavy state investment in education uh, has helped in, uh, in, in, in the last decades, and especially in the, um, in the 80s, 70s, and 80s, um, so this investment has uh, um, this investment have helped uh, young people 
coming from poor family to have access to education, uh, also to university and uh, to have access to a well-paid job. So the possibility of people from lower social strata to access uh, to good jobs and also to improve their social condition was in, certain, in a certain sense a guarantee from the states until, um, until let's say the 2000, the 90s and the 2000. But the, as, as I've already showed in the in first part of my presentation, uh, this connection between education and access to good jobs is not working anymore. Uh, so what we can say that is that despite the high level of educational attainment in, in the region, there is a disconnect between what students learn and what productive jobs require. Uh, the, the pro this problem is more pronounced for women. For, in, in fact, following the gender norms, so it's what we can call gender paradigm, women are inclined to study, uh, to study uh, uh, humanities, healthcare, welfare, arts. Uh, this educational specialization in turn limit the job opportunities available to educated women. Uh, in fact, uh, predominantly public sector position in education, health uh, and um, administration are, are being cut. Um, that's one reason this disconnection between uh, education and job opportunities is one of the main reasons for women under uh, un unemployed and under unemployed. Women, for example, are also less able than men to participate in what's called vocational training. Uh, so the kind of training which is uh, dedicated to, uh, to, 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 create, um, to create job abilities um, for, people, for people attending. So women are less likely than men to acquire job relevant skills out, outside formal education. As a result, women have relatively less diversified and fewer marketable skills than men do. This limitation restrict women's ability to adjust their skill to suit private sector employers. According to uh, the analysis provided by the International Labour Organization, the main problems relating to gender in North African labour markets are represented by low quality employment, high level of informal employment, depressing wage and very, and very long study to work transition path, resulting in high rates of unemployment and inactivity. There is a little consensus in the literature on how to stimulate job creation. Approaches span from emphasis on skill specialization and division of labor to promoting investment in infrastructure and human capital and enhancing macroeconomic stability and good governance. Mainstream policies focus uh, focus on cooperation between public and private sectors and between state and civil society organization to improve employment outcomes. Uh, the considerable difference between young women and young men in terms of the overall participation in labor force is partially due, as I've already said, to social norms according, according to which women, especially married women, are not expected to work outside the family circle. Families, uh, fam women's uh, primary role as housewives and caretakers of children and elders within the family is due not only to the norms of a conservative patriarchal society, but also to the difficult nature of accessing childcare and other social services. Married women have fewer chances being employed in the formal and informal sector than their male counterparts. The private sector in particular seems to be a hostile environment for women where women uh, both face discrimination um, against female applicants 
on the part of the employers and also often themselves refrain from engaging in long-term training and long working hours in the private sector. Having internalized the prevailing social norms that, that place women primarily within the household. the household. The gender gap is exacerbated in rural areas where almost half of young female population does not enter the labor market at all. For both women and men being a new entrant into labor market increases the probability of unemployment. The level of education does not influence women's inclusion in labor force, but women with a tertiary, tertiary education often do not renounce to hope, the hope of finding a job, even when not actively looking, uh, looking, for, um, looking for, for, for a job. Um, According to the International Labor Organization, a way out the high unemployment rate, which has deteriorated the social economic stability of most Arab countries, could lie in rethinking the recruitment system and innovating the rural educational system in order to provide young people with qualification and skill necessary to meet the profound change in the labor markets. In its reports, the, uh, the International Labor Organization uh, gave resonance to young, young people's widespread demand to be provided with better job opportunities and to be allowed to participate in political de decision-making processes related to education and labor by inviting the, the Arab countries to put emphasis on an innovative-based schooling and training system and to foster the creation of new companies and or entrepreneurial activities by providing counseling services and specific training in business management. I, personally, I do not agree with such solution. I mean, the solution is quite easy. So just the, the, you, you don't have job, please create one. I mean, it's too easy, but this is what the International um, Labor Organization uh, suggests as solution or, or as one of the main solution for the crisis, for the labor, labor crisis. Um, I don't know if we have already, uh, okay, I go just a little bit, uh, yes, just a little bit. Uh, I continue with this slide and then we can have uh, um, again a Q&A &A Q &A session and then I would suggest a short break if you, if you. Sure, can. let's go like this. Okay. Um, just a few words about uh, female entre entrepreneurship in North Africa. Uh, Self-employment is rare among, uh, among young men, uh, almost non-existent among young women in the MENA region. Uh, the young women continue to be underrepresented, underrepresented as uh, business owners. Across the MENA region, as you can see, as you can see only 13% of films are owned, owned by women. Those are uh, mainly micro or small enterprises, often not formalized, uh, operating in, uh, normally in the service, uh, services sector. Um, this gap uh, is seemingly due to the fact that women entrepreneurs start their business uh, from a relatively modest base, having more limited educational uh, backgrounds, training and experience than, than their male counterparts. Uh, women's modest beginnings uh, coupled with the heavy burden uh, borne by women uh, with regard to family and to social responsibilities affect their performance the size of their uh, enterprises, markets, and economic activities. Uh, moreover, a number of social, economic, and cultural obstacles discourage women from becoming entrepreneurs. Uh, chief among these, the regulatory and legal environment of most MENA countries, as well as issues of public order. Another problem is lack uh, of access to financing this is one of the one of the major obstacles in empowering women's business activity 
Uh, therefore, uh, ILO invites policymakers, companies, employers, uh, organizations, and business associations to support women's advancement uh, in the private sector in the MENA region. Boosting, boosting women's entrepreneurship and providing training in small and medium enterprise management should constitute a policy priority aiming not only at empowering women economically, but also towards ensuring, in, ensuring inclusive economic growth and sustainable employment, uh, employment and development. Okay, I think we can stop here, then I can switch for the last part of the presentation to uh, microcredit as, as a tool of development, especially for rural, rural, uh, women, uh, li women living in the rural area. Uh, now I think we can have again a, a Q&A session and then a short break. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question uh, even related uh, probably uh, by, by linking your presentation to the rise the topic. Because then you showed us that basically it seems, as you presented the topic, it seems that two different vulnerabilities are coming together when it comes to allow women to enter the job market. We have the, the already present vulnerability of being in a patriarchal system or having less access to education as you showed and then the problem of entering in a job market where the unemployment rate is is very high where the condition of work are not the best one as you said the problem of being employment in services so i have two questions on that which one of the two vulnerabilities must be addressed before so the, the structural issue or the access to the job market and then is this according to you forcing and pushing the migration the the the, 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 the migration movements of those people um, to increase the number so are we seeing an increasing number of migration of women migration because of this situation or uh, the migration is appeared uh, is uh, is going autonomously uh, because for example when it comes to university level uh, we we see and we noticed an increased number of young women leaving the country for studying abroad and then not coming back. Uh, so this is a really a sort of brain drain effect. So I would like to know from you on these three points, uh, what is your opinion about it? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Marco. I'll try to answer your question. Um, which, um, uh, which, which factor should be addressed first, uh, structure or job market? Um, I think they are connected. Okay, um, patriarchal norms uh, really, really influence the women's possibility to access um, to access uh, to access in, 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 the, in the labor market, uh, but they're not alone because they are coupled with other, let's say, with a patriarchal society. Uh, but the patriarchal society um, expecting that women uh, take care of children and, and of elders in the family. So the lack, the lack, the lack of infrastructure like um, uh, uh, infrastructure for child care or, elder, or elderly care, uh, like kindergarten and, and so on, um, dramatically, dramatically influenced the possibility of women to to find to look for a job, let's imagine a married a married a married woman uh, who has child who has children. If there is no if, if there is someone in the family uh, who can help her, oh, it's okay. Let's say mother, aunts, and so on. Uh, but if there is not, uh, if, uh, if for example there is a family moved in another in another town just 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 a simple a simple a stupid examples and there is not enough uh, ch enough a child a children or the elderly case uh, infrastructure available for the families the the, the woman has to decide what, what i what i will do uh, will, will i take care of my children or i, I find a job and the, the pressure of the family more is 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 for in the direction of 
uh, of giving priority to household and, and family care. So the two elements are coupled actually. They are not an element on one side, an element on the other side. So both patriarchal norms and uh, and uh, and the, the general the, the general structure of job markets and the general structure of the society should be addressed to in order to find a solution. So both, I mean, but I think in Italy we experience more or less the same situation, especially in the south of Italy, where the lack of of the of the of, of the infrastructure. Um, force uh, young young women young women to prioritize their role within the family instead of look for a job. We are also a, a a rate of unemployment among women. It's quite fifty percent. It's a high, high very high level in some region of Southeast Italy. So that's not a problem with, with, uh, which 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 we don't own as Italy. So I think both. Both uh, patriarchal norm, and both job market structure should be uh, addressed in order to uh, find a solution. Uh, as far as the brain drain effect, this is a, another crucial problem in the in not in the region, and brain brain drain effect uh, impact not only on women. You mentioned the case of young educated women who who, um, who move abroad. Uh, but in Gina, young people, young educated men, the best part of the, of the youth of MENA County, if they can, they move abroad. So the brain drain effect is, uh, is depriving the region of, uh, of its better, better, with better children, the more motivated, the more active, the more intelligent, uh, the, the smarter and, and so on. And of course, the job situation in, in, the, in the region, um, the lack of job opportunities is a big push factor for migration, not only for women, but in general for young people. Uh, just think about young Tunisian who are well-educated and they cannot find a decent job in their country and they try to go abroad as they can, as they as, as they can. So this uh, frustration among among youth is one of the, I mean, I think one of the worst social problem in the region. Right. We, we in Italy we 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 know we, we, we know the problem. We have already experimented this this problem, this 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 feeling of fr this frustration feeling among young educated people who have to wait for a job. But this, we can double and double this frustration in order to figure out how uh, young women, and young, young, educated young women and young men uh, must feel in several MENA, MENA countries. Thank you very much. You are welcome. So we restart our um, our um, our meeting uh, with the last part of my presentation that will be on the role of microcredit in creating new opportunities for North African women. Here uh, you you can see a picture of. Uh, about uh, of the microfinance uh, institution in uh, uh, in the world, especially in emer in emerging uh, countries, emerging and, and and middle developed countries. Uh, and as you can see, um, the, the the rate uh, the rate of micro of micro yeah, particular microfinance institution in Middle East and or in North Africa is the lowest. In the world, so um, we can we uh, we can speak. We will speak about microcredit, uh, but we have to think about that this um, uh, this, this this element this um, is 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 still um, underused uh, in in the in the region, comparing to other part of the of the world, especially uh, Africa. Uh, where microcredit and microfinance is quite widespread, and Latin America as well. Uh, okay, 
uh, given, um, give, as, as, I was, as I already uh, said, given the features that characterize North African labor market and the fact that the majority of women in the region are in vulnerable employment, either as self-employed workers or contributed uh, their labor within the family, access to microfinance services proves crucial for their economic uh, em empowerment or the, let's say, could prove crucial for their economic empowerment. Poor women, in particular those living in rural areas, face many obstacles then, uh, that hamper their access to education, employment opportunities, land ownership, and other productive resources, including all forms of financing. Uh, as I have already said, uh, speaking about women entrepreneurship in the MENA region, in particular in North Africa, the difficult in accessing to uh, five forms of financing is one of the main problems hampering their, um, their activity. These major constraints not only prevent women from securing a decent and productive um, job, but impact negatively on their families and communities as well. It is increasingly recognized that reducing gender inequalities regarding access to employment, re employment resources and services may help to reduce the number of people suffering for, uh, for, suffering for poverty uh, worldwide. Most rural women work mainly in the informal sector or in unstable and low income activities. They generally work harder than men as they, must, they, as they must also carry out the majority of housekeeping tasks, including care for children and elderly parents, and also participate in additional unpaid productive work, such as uh, agricultural work, tending to, uh, to, to livestock. This accumulation of tasks resulting from dominant gender paradigms, as well as from lack of basic social infrastructures, limit women's opportunities to access paid work and expose them to poverty and marginalization more than their male counterparts. Uh, I think, uh, Marco, if I don't, um, if I'm not wrong, uh, your program is is, uh, uh, is especially about margin marginalization, poverty reduction, yes. and so on. It's so I think that taking, taking care yes. uh, about uh, women under employment is is is, is um, could help a lot your program. Definitely, I would definitely say. Can. Sure. Uh, the spread of microfinance programs in rural areas has improved women's access. To funding, uh, to funding resources. Several initiatives uh, managed by uh, NGOs or specialized institutions have begun to offer loans or formal funding to pro prospective women entrepreneurs. Loans for macrofinance institutions are frequently provided to groups of people rather than to individuals as a means of uh, ensuring greater security to the microfinance uh, institution. Though many microfinance institutions continue to mostly lead to groups, lending to individuals has become increasingly widespread. Today, uh, microfinance institutions offer diversified loan products, including personal saving options, housing loans, insurance packages and social services, including health, education, and care. So the, um, there's a quite uh, widespread uh, um, range of products which are offered as uh, micro, uh, micro uh, finance uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, policymakers and non-governmental organizations have long seen microcredit as a potential solution to the most pressing challenges affecting developing countries. In Morocco, for example, such challenges include, I quote, uh, poverty eradication and promoting sustainable development. Uh, in 2000, uh, uh, here I want just to show two case studies very shortly. Uh, one case study focusing on Morocco and one case study focusing on Tunisia. Then I will go to conclusion. 
uh, in 2012, the Moroccan microfinance sector developed a national microfinance strategy aiming uh, mainly at reducing poverty through the creation of jobs and other income generating activity. Currently, Morocco is a leading country in North Africa with respect to microfinance sector with 13 microfinance associations operating in, in the country. Four operate, uh, operates at national level, especially Alamana, um, uh, La Fondation Banco Popular Microcredit, um, the Foundation for Local Development Partnership, um, AIRDI um, Association. Three operate at regional level, especially Moroccan Solidarity Without Borders Association, uh, Microcredit, INMA and Alcarama Association. Probably you know these associations, probably you have already dealt with, I, I don't know. And five are focused uh, at local level. Uh, La Fondation du Nord, uh, Atil, Ismailia, Tawada and, um, and Amos. This organization provide uh, 6 60 percent of the loans in urban areas and 40 in rural areas. 50.3% uh, of the target population are women. So we can say that are mainly dedicated to women with a good percentage of women in, in the rural area. Uh, marginalized women, especially rural women, are mostly excluded from access to formal funding, uh, formal funding resources. Hence, women are the primary recipient of microfinance loans. Microfinance has some positive impact on women and their family in short term, mainly in cases in which there is already established business. Um, financial uh, support to promote enterprises development has led to a small but significant positive impact on women's income and asset availability also in other countries, for example, in Egypt, um, and has also a positive effect in improving uh, the, uh, schooling attendance uh, by the children, women involved in, in microcredit programs. But generally speaking, microcredit and microfinance helps in particular already existent, existent uh, small enterprises or small, or small business. Uh, in Morocco, positive effects are clearly dis uh, discernible with regards of existing household-based self-employment activities, uh, both in terms of sales and profits, and for agriculture and live, uh, livestock rearing activities. While there, there has been no clear effect on women's probability of establishing new business, so the effect of microcredit in terms of creating new activities is quite low. Uh, this finding uh, is contrary to evidence from other regions where enterprise support, uh, enterprise support programs instead frequently succeed in stimulating the establishment of new ventures rather than solely the growth of the existing ones. Uh, in general, I think this is a point that uh, should be more uh, more debated and more studied, more analyzed in the countries in order to understand why the impact of microcredit, microfinancing creating uh, new business, in particular new business, uh, new uh, small and micro enterprises run by women is still very, um, is still very, very few. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not a big in, impact. Generally speaking, there is, a, there is now a considerable consensus that providing loans to the poor can lead to a successful outcome, uh, provided that the loan is accompanied by other services. Studied by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, emphasizes that credit needs to be supplemented with access to land, appropriate training, technology and information. But such activities require strong support from public sector. In some of the lowest income countries of the world, lack of, uh, of access to land is the most critical uh, single cause of rural poverty, 
which in turn is the dominant context of deprivation in these countries. But few, but, but very few countries have undertaken substantial land reform programs, especially Morocco. As you know, in Morocco, the problem of land ownership, particularly women lands ownership, is one of the prob problem uh, keeping keeping uh, women away from uh, from la from land from land property. Uh, moreover, uh, non-governmental organization and foreign donors have played an increasing role in the proliferation of micro-lending institutions. Uh, Non-governmental organizations vary in quality and strength. Research show that the best results are produced when governments of developing countries and non-governmental organizations work hand in hand. I think you can tell me more about this point of non-governmental organization and uh, and uh, uh, govern and, and the states working together and the positive effect that this cooperation can have in uh, implementing the in, in in implementing uh, new new programs. Uh, there exists a general tendency to presume that women are most trustworthy than men and invest more in the welfare of the family than men do. That's one of the, the crucial point in the microcredit programs, which are generally speaking directed to women, not only because they are uh, they represent the most deprived segment of the population, especially of the rural population, but also because they are proven to be more, more reliable in uh, paying back the loan than men are. Uh, this, 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 for example, one of the main, um, on the main finding of um, Mohammed Yunus at the Grameen Bank, uh, which is dedica dedicated, uh, which is mainly focused on loan to, uh, to women. Um, thus, women are an appropriate target group for mitigating poverty and maximizing the social impact of development strategies. Most microfinancing research provides theoretical arguments to explain the preference for lending to women, but very few of these are based on actual data. One key uh, guiding rationale has been that women are perceived as less inclined to our corruption than men. In fact, for example, uh, since uh, 1996, the Zakura Foundation, uh, which is the first organization to offer microcredit in Morocco, reported a repayment rate of nearly uh, 100% due both to its intensive coaching and supervision of borrowers, as well as to women's better repayment practice compared to men's. The general belief in Morocco that women are less corrupt than men, along with the greater tendency of Moroccan women to repay loans, has led not only to women being targeted more often by microfinance programs, but more broadly to positive developments for the country's economy. Recent findings have confirmed this relationship between microcredit loans to women and improved economic growth. Empirical research in Morocco and elsewhere suggests that the reason why women beneficiaries are better able to repay their loans is because they are generally involved in activities with shorter life cycle, uh, cycle, uh, cycles and take loans that are within their repayment uh, capacities. So this is another reason for, uh, um, for explaining uh, why women are the the best target for microcredit um, initiatives. Further to this, within Morocco's uh, male-dominated society, microcredit loan, loans to women give them greater control of household resources and consequently more resources to dedicate to children, food, health, and education. As women in Morocco are at the center of extended family structures and bear the weight of a deficient social system, they play a crucial role in development. Uh, okay, now I'm finished with Morocco. I will switch to Tunisia. 
Uh, I don't know if you have um, questions concerning Morocco or also remarks. I think you can also share uh, your experience. Uh, probably could be useful for people listening at the webinar in the future. Well, again, thank you very much. I'm, uh, you I'm are very... mute, uh, Marco. No, you should listen to me now. Mm. Still mm. muted? No. Is it clear, my voice? I, I, can, I can hear you. I can hear you very well. Oh, okay. Very well. Yes, just yes. Oh, anyway. No, just two points. Um, I'm curious to know uh, more in details why uh, Morocco developed this microcredit system and microfinance sector in such uh, a proper way, if, apart from the national strategy, if there are cultural uh, issues that allowed Moroccan uh, to develop this sector with respect to other Maghrebian country, at least, if there is, if there are other uh, um, other reasons behind it, and then um, the other interesting things I would like you to elaborate a little bit more because it's it's specifically interested in a region where unfortunately corruption is widespread. Uh, if this issue of corruption is common to other countries, if this issue of corrupt not, the less corruption of women sector. Uh, is uh, uh, is common also to other countries, or if it is a Moroccan um, peculiarity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. Um, okay, why Morocco has a more developed micro micro credit and microfinance sector? Um, I think there are several reasons. Um, comparing to the to the North Africa and MENA region, uh, Morocco, Palestine and Tunisia are the leading countries concerning, uh, concerning microcredit initiatives. Um, I think one reason uh, is uh, that there are, is the presence of, um, of a widespread, a very active and, uh, and lively association system in the country. So the country has a, a, go, a very good I mean, uh, a, a good, a good of several associations from I mean, bottom, bottom, bottom down association, uh, which help in uh, in in the implementing of initiatives. Even, even when initiatives are uh, coordinated by the state or state uh, state led uh, initiatives, like the case, for example, of some of the issues I mentioned here in this slide. I think the presence. Of a well-developed uh, third sector, a well-developed uh, association system uh, helps a lot in uh, in implementing these initiatives. So uh, women had already um, used to uh, to be in a city, to to be to being part to be member of associations and also self-organized associations. Uh, there are several cooperatives, women's cooperatives, female cooperatives in Morocco in several sectors. It's also a factor which helps in creating a solidarity and in creating a capacity of working together. That's it. I mean, that's one of the point, the main point for uh, for microcredit initiative uh, uh, proper working. Um, so I think that's one reason. It's not exactly a cultural reason, but I, mean, I think the presence of a widespread a spread association system comparing to other countries, for example, Egypt, is one of the main factor um, um, for the the presence the, the presence in Morocco of a good microfinance sector. Uh, as far as corruption, uh, uh, the idea, the, the concept, also the assumption would be better to say that women are less corrupted than men uh, is a widespread assumption. I, I mentioned um, Mohammed Yunus, uh, Yunus initiatives in Bangladesh, the Grameen Bank, which is focused, started with women, is still focused on women. Uh, because women all over the world, in all developing countries, uh, proved to be more reliable than men concerning repayment of loan. Uh, probably because they are, I mean, they take they take more they take care more than men um, of family of children families, so they are more responsible. You can say, uh, and also as far as Morocco is concerned. 
um, another element has been has been uh, um, has been underlined is the element that women take loan loans that are able to repay. So they are they are not going they are not taking a big big loan that they, that they will they, they won't uh, they won't be able to to repay. So this is the, okay. so for the women this this capacity or the the capacity of uh, doing small things is probably one of the reason uh, that uh, that that in, in in that enable them to repay the loan more than men. Thank you very much. Raniero, you have a question. Mm. Yes, I have. I, well, I have uh, several questions because uh, microfinance is, is uh, something uh, I have been, uh, in a way, studying. I read uh, Mohammed Yunus, uh, the first book where he, he, he told the story of how he created the Grameen Bank. Uh, but then, uh, um, and uh, we, in many of the projects that we have, uh, uh, written and participated uh, uh, the uh, the issue of uh, creating new companies enterprises which is i mean uh, the the upper side of of what microfinance is is, is about uh, there is one issue which you mentioned which I, we are very interested in and that is that in order to promote entrepreneurship uh, uh, money is not enough you no, money is you, you have to add to that uh, training, uh, support, consultancy, uh, because and, and, and one, one, one concept we have been elaborated in the last few months is it goes even farther down this line, which is not everybody is suited to be an entrepreneur. Uh, it's not because you have a good idea and maybe you have some funding that your, your new activity will be successful. So one point, one, one concept that we have tried to implement in several of the proposals, project proposals we have been writing was that it would be good also <clears throat> uh, to select the people who are able to become an entrepreneur because otherwise you are going to create frustration. If, if uh, you, know, you support someone, uh, for instance, myself, I, I, have, I think I have lots of good ideas, but I'm not a good entrepreneur. I'm not good at negotiating and this kind of thing. So I shouldn't be on myself an entrepreneur. Can, can you elaborate on, on how we can implement these concepts further in the, in the project proposals that we write? Uh, I absolutely, thanks a lot, Raniero. I absolutely agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, at the very beginning of this presentation, I, I, I say that one of the main, uh, main proposal for, um, for overcome the crisis in the MENA region uh, by the, 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 the international institution is to, uh, to create new uh, entrepreneurs. Just to, to I mean, the, 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 the motto is there is no job, please create one by yourself. And I think it's stupid, of course, because no one, as you said, um, can be an entrepreneur. So I think the point you mentioned that it's, it's a crucial one. Uh, actually, you must select people to be involved in the microfinance and microcredit uh, initiatives. And I think in these cases, uh, probably uh, cooperated with uh, already existent um, um, association or, or cooperative and so on can help in selecting people. I think um, uh, bottom-up uh, bottom cooperation, so starting from the association already already operating in the territory uh, in, in, in cooperated with the also international NGOs and etc. could be uh, a way for understand uh, who are the people, who are the women, uh, who can be involved in a, in a program. I think, yes, I absolutely agree with you uh, that uh, financing alone doesn't help. Financing must be coupled with training, supervision, uh, technical training, uh, and, and et cetera, providing, providing infrastructure and et cetera. And all this must again be associated with 
good selection of people. Other, otherwise, uh, the program are going to, to be a mess. I mean, it, it actually, a lot of programs are, are a mess, are not uh, impacting significantly in poverty reduction, and even not significantly in, uh, in women empowerment and women agency, where they are implemented. Thank you. Okay, uh, I don't know if Thais has questions also. She wants to share her experience. No, I'm just uh, listening to you and learning about also but not uh, any doubt. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I move to uh, the case of Tunisia. And the role of my credit, micro, micro credit, and microfinance in, in Tunisia. Uh, in Tunisia, poverty eradication policies and programs in rural areas are a main part of national or secular programs, such as the economic and, and social development strategies. For example, one was developed for 2000, 2012 2016. Uh, integrated uh, development projects, outreach programs for rural women, many of which are supported by international donors. Rural women access microcredit primarily through uh, microfinance institutions, including, uh, including microfinance uh, agency, ENDA, which is the, the, uh, the biggest microfinance uh, institution in Tunisia, banks, uh, mainly the Tunisian Solidarity Bank, uh, which in turn funds a number of microcredit agencies and the post office in Tunisia. The possibility to, of accessing uh, microcredit uh, contributes to the improvement of the standard of living of the targeted population by increasing their stock of goods by 80, 80, 83%, uh, their education and nutrition by 52%, and their health by 39%. In particular, microcredit impacts on women's capacity to achieve their dream, let's say, without having to borrow money from family or friends and instead uh, retaining control of their our, our resources. Though uh, the impact on household income and on the standard of living is positive, Microcredit nonetheless has its shortcomings. In particular, it does not allow for the building, build, build up of savings or investment that might enable women to pay off expensive, loan, expensive loans. Moreover, access to microcredit does not significantly impact power relation within the family. Men continue to have absolute control while women's workload increases and men's financial participation in family decreases. However, success in the project, the women's uh, uh, portions and the attainment on financial autonomy are generally positive results for women with regards to their relationship with their male relatives and neighbors who often show more consideration and respect towards them. Uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, though microcredit in the main formal economic resources in uh, rural areas, um, with the exception of for Algeria where a financial mechanism are provided by uh, micro, micro by, by, provided by the gov government, um, um, generally speaking, the um, structure are, um, are managed by um, NGOs or, um, or private institutions. The, the, speaking about the region, the access to program uh, varies a lot, as we already mentioned at the beginning, um, from one country to another. In, uh, in the rural areas of Indonesia, for example, very few rural women benefit from uh, microcredit by, um, by microcredit agency, while 65% uh, benefit from ENDA uh, microcredit loans. 
in Morocco and Egypt, for example, uh, access is unequal between men and women and between urban and uh, rural women. Uh, despite uh, the considerable development of the microfinance in the rural areas, non nonetheless, um, the, the beneficiaries of uh, microfinance and microcredit niches, niches are mainly uh, women living in the rural, uh, in the sorry, in the urban areas. In Egypt, for example, indicators show that women have less access than men to banking services in general, and in particular, rural women do not make extensive use of banking services, but instead only access rural finance within specific projects dedicated specifically to them. So I think the possibility of uh, the, pos the, pos the capacity and possibilities of rural women to access to uh, financing uh, in the must be uh, must be dramatically in, improved. Uh, women's participation in micro uh, macro finance program uh, does not necessarily lead directly to their social and political imp improvement or the, uh, improve their agency. Nonetheless, facilitating access for poor women to productive and funding resources, along with policies for the reduction of gender inequalities and improvement of women's legal, economic, and social status, has a strong positive effect on development. Uh, as you know, microcredit is very debated as tool of empowerment especially uh, in the developing countries. And there's a, a, a big debate in, the, in, in academia and, and among researchers, how to consider microcredits um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, microcredit can be again, let's say capitalistic and a neoliberal tools, sometimes, sometimes of uh, spoliation, of population and in particular women, uh, so it's it's um, its capacity of uh, produce empowerment agency is debated. Um, I think that uh, at at macro level, uh, microcredit and microfinance are very uh, a very low impact. It can have impact at the micro level uh, in, within the household, within, within a village, uh, within, within a community. So I think we have to, uh, we have to um, let's say, to, to, to divide, to, to divide the, the, the influence of or the impact of microcredit at level of, of uh, poverty reduction and uh, development at a macro level. And consider more its impact on micro, uh, on, a, on a micro level. And also in this case, the impact um, is debatable. It can influence uh, influence the the gender relations, but also cannot can improve the economic situation of women and some, but cannot cannot in some cases. So I think uh, micro credit and microfinance alone as instrument of gender empowerment are not sufficient. And I don't know what do you, what do you think about as especially in the sector of cooperation. Um, okay, now we can have another uh, Q&A break if you want, and then I will move to, to uh, the conclusion. Well, one, one consideration, uh, Celia, is that in some of these countries, uh, I'm, I know for sure, for instance, in the, uh, the, in the Gulf countries, in uh, <coughs> the Emirates, uh, a woman, in order to open up a bank account, she needs the authorization of her husband. Okay, <laughs> so it's really a regulatory problem, not, on, not only a cultural problem, you know. And I had a friend who, who, who used to live uh, in, I think it, I don't remember where it was, Dubai or, or, or Abu Dhabi. And she said that, uh, that the, she had the credit card and whenever she, she made an expense with the credit card, the bank would send an SMS to her husband, not to her, 
to inform him of the expenses. So I think uh, uh, that in some of these countries, there is also not only a cultural problem, but also a regulatory problem. Absolutely. Which, which hampers. Whereas, for instance, from what I know in, uh, in Morocco, I have many, many, uh, we have had in one of our projects a partner, which was the Association of Women Entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Ah, oui, I know. And they are very active, and I would even say sometimes quite aggressive because <laughs> they have to defend themselves. And what they tell me is that uh, in Morocco, for instance, is the other way around. From the regulatory point of view, they are very, very much protected. But then the reality of the of the the culture of the of the country is still very much uh, man centered. I don't know if you have the same. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, I absolutely agree with you. Absolutely agree with you. There is a regulatory problem uh, at the legal level in some cases. You mentioned in the case of, of the Gulf, absolutely. Even if uh, things are changing there. Uh, and on the other side, uh, where there is not this regulatory problem as in Morocco, uh, there are so, um, no, so social norms hampering women uh, from accessing to to financing i absolutely agree with you um we should operate uh, states accounts uh, states should operate at both regulatory regulatory level uh, changing some uh, legal norms um Empering women's women's access to to financing, and on this on a social level, uh, trying to improve women education, uh, women health, and all the tools uh, which can improve women agency uh, their capacity to actively participate in the in the society. Okay, thank you. I think you can. If there are no other questions, Thais. Uh, I'm curious to, always when it comes to the Tunisian case, which I've been on uh, the, when discussing about economy in Tunisia, we recently visited the country several times for other projects. And uh, um, as you say, there is this experience of uh, rural women having access through microcredit. Then uh, more than a question, it's, a, it's a, a comment, and I would like to know your opinion on that. I. I never saw Tunisia experiencing such an economic crisis like the one they are experiencing now. Uh, when you see that tomatoes are costing around one euro 0.5, it's, it's complicated to, to, to explain how the effect of microcredit, the impact of microcredit. So it's, a, it's really, a, 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 really a, a dramatic situation in, in some cases when you have salaries that are going 400, 500 euro if you are lucky enough per month. Um, but then uh, probably the, the, the question lies in, in the first thing, the, the answer lies in the first thing you said at the beginning of this uh, really interesting uh, webinar when you said countries are forced because of their external debt to yes. do what is, let's say in a certain sense, imposed on them. And we are seeing also in Tunisia a constant privatization of uh, also the, the, the state structure. Uh, so I don't just I don't want to move on again because uh, um, to, I don't want, just want to move on too much. But then, how this is framed into this huge economic crisis? Are we wasting time in some cases by putting attention on, on these small projects while more structural reforms are needed? What is your opinion on that? Because Wow, Marco, that's a big, a big question. Yeah. <laughs> a million dollar question. Million dollar. Uh, um, uh, okay, uh, I think this macro level initiatives are fundamental uh, and can improve the, the can improve the situation of women at the macro level, at the level of village or the level of single women's communities and so on. Uh, also, they can have an impact on the biodiversity. The intensive agriculture in Tunisia, you mentioned Tunisia, Tunisia is suffering intensive agriculture, uh, which is dramatically negatively affecting on the bio biodiversity, which is dying, in dying in favor of the culture um, for export. So intensive culture for export. And, and supporting small initiatives can all, not, not only 
um, help women in uh, in, a, in a better economic situation, but also can help biodiversity. So I think that initiatives, in, uh, initi microcredit initiatives, or small initiatives, are fundamental. But as you mentioned, I can I can add add very few to your uh, to your comments. But as you mentioned. The general economic crisis, uh, several countries, in particular Tunisia, is experiencing, and the, the growing international debt, I mean, is a is a, is a enormous stone on the way on, on on Tunisia path to economic growth. How can they can do? They can do no, nothing but accept the external condition. What they can do? Nothing. So it's a, it's a vicious circle uh, rep, uh, replicating itself. Uh, the, the poor, poor kind of cannot go out from the debt. They have to, to ask for more, more loans so they cannot go out from the repayments. So there's a problem. I mean, I'm not Catholic. I mean, let's say I'm a believer, but not, not, not Catholic. I mean, uh, not practical. Uh, but I think what Papa Francesco say, said and says about the cancellation or reduction of the debt, about this egoism of the, of the, of the North uh, against the, the South, I mean, it's something that we should consider, we should think about. Because, okay, we can help these countries, but if we don't change the general condition, the general, uh, the general, uh, power relation between North and South, between developed and developing countries. If we continue to spoiling the, the, the developing country because we, we want to have slow cost products in our supermarkets, what we can do? We cannot go out from this circus. I mean, that's the problem. Yeah, and even change the power structure within the country. Within the country. Also within the For country, sure. it seems to For me sure. that the power structure are still there and uh, like before, in a way. Right? Yes, yes. The problem, of, the problem of corruption is still there. Yeah. Uh, the, the, yes, the, 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 the still there. So nothing has changed, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving to moving to the conclusion. Uh, okay, uh, what we can say. Um, how, how can the economic participation of women in North African labor market be enhanced? I think that's the, the, the main question of this presentation. Researchers have suggested that North African countries ought to implement policies more conducive to women's participation in the labor market and to gender equality. Such policies, policies should support women's entrepreneurship Promote, promote access to infrastructures for the care of children and elderly, implement fiscal policies promoting to earn families, reduce discrimination with respect to wages and career opportunities. Micro and small enterprises have proven crucial for the economic development of North African countries. Specific policies hold further fostered enterprises run by women and encourage more women to enter the sector by reducing uncertainty, corruption, facilitating access to credit and promoting investment in infrastructure. Over the past few decades, international organizations have promoted several initiatives to increase women's participation in the economic and social spheres. Much of their research and operational effort have concentrated on women's participation in microcredit, microcredit and microfinance initiatives, suggesting that the latter have a strong positive impact on women's financial independence, capabilities and responsibilities. Though they do not necessarily lead directly to women's economic and social political empowerment. Microfinance and microcredit initiatives bring women together, providing them with a support group and an expansion of their responsibilities beyond traditional household duties. They have the unique capability to reach marginalized female population 
who have little uh, to no access to health care, uh, to health care, health insurance, and health information. Survey findings suggest the microcredit and microfinance institutions are ideal for launching health related services. This connection has a strong positive impact on both women's empowerment and sexual and reproductive health. Moreover, promoting poor women's access to productive resources has a positive effect within the household and local communities, communities and results in strong dividends for development. Implementation of gender sensitive policies proves to be crucial in reducing gender inequalities in the labor market. Access to decent jobs contributes to expand women's agency and possibilities. It increases their ability to influence society and challenges the traditional norms that hamper their participation in the political and social economic arena. In order to reduce unemployment and to draw to the full potential of the human resources, North African countries should invest in a better quality educated labor force that meets the skill requirements of the modern market. Government should implement, positive, should implement effective policies to contrast persistent gender divides without further liberalization. The remedy to the current state of affairs can only be found in domestic political reforms aimed at producing a credible juridical structure to enforce equality and to eliminate unjust labor market segregation. The lack of gender specific analysis or awareness regarding socioeconomic issues and the political situation will result in policies and programs that only replicate existing systematic obstacles and hamper women's empowerment and their involvement in society as fully fledged economic players. This situation calls for a review of current policies and laws with the aim of ensuring that all women, including those living and working in rural areas, enjoy equal access to productive resources, basic services, employment opportunity, and labor saving technologies. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I just have a few words. At the end of the presentation, you find a, the bibliography I use it to prepare this presentation. Uh, there are mainly online uh, repos, so you, have, you, you, are, you, you can f easily access them. Okay, thank you very much. Can, can, can I make a, a final question? Of course, question. of course. Uh, you can. I have. I yeah. have a question. Oh, please, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was thinking about uh, besides all that, uh, uh, all those initiatives, uh, uh, microcredits and uh, educational programs. Do you think the those women are integrated? Uh, I say, if they are, uh, if they. Haniero said about uh, an association, but uh, do you think there are many um, groups or networks <laughs> uh, to to fight th themselves to to have more empowerment and to to fight uh, of those those things they are. Uh, against those, uh, all those discriminations uh, scenario, how do you think about those integrations? Um, thank you very much, uh, Thais, for these questions. I think it's a crucial question. And I think that one of the, the positive outcome, outcomes of the, um, of the revolts is the growing, uh, the growing um, involvement of women at the level of the civil society society with a growing number of as women female association all over the women, all over the MENA region uh, all, all over North Africa uh, in particular in Morocco and Tunisia 
and women are experiencing uh, mean, a growing capacity to, uh, of being together, of associate, of cooperating at different levels, not only at the economic level. Uh, Raniero mentioned the, uh, the organization of, of women entrepreneurs in Morocco, which, which is very active. This is a, I mean, a similar association in Tunisia as well, but there are also small association, uh, so bottom association, um, uh, or, or women, uh, which uh, which can can help a lot in in empowering in in in, in empowering uh, women at all level, at a rural level, at a urban level level. Um, so if you if you simple you Google you can Google in inter simply uh, women association North Africa Tunisia Morocco and you will find. Uh, plenty of association. Morocco and Tunisia already had before, also before, even before the revolution, uh, the, outspring, the, 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 the Arab Spring, um, a good, so a good uh, civil society, a good, a, a good number of associations, sometimes uh, controlled by the state or promoted by the states. Um, so let's say that the, the, the ground was already fertile. So after the revolution, uh, there was the possibility for the women to uh, to develop and then to create new association. And I think this is even with the problems that are still there, especially economic problem. I think this vitality in the association uh, in the association field. It's a very positive outcome of the 2000-2011 revolution. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yeah. There are, for example, also small association, for example, in Morocco on women producing argan oil. I mean, there are a lot of, of initiatives um, at all level, at all level. Or women um, associated against discrimination, for example, against harassment. Uh, and, and women are more and more able to to go on the street and to protest on the street. Yeah, yeah, it's good because I think it's crucial to. It's crucial. I agree with you. I agree with you. For a change. No, just one very last, uh, very quick question. When you showed us the slide with the uh, uh, microfinance institution all over the world, uh, Europe was not mentioned at all. So is there? Yeah. Uh, is in in, uh, in 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 I mean the European Union in in, in Europe. Are there any microfinance institutions which are working? Is it something I have heard that it was mentioned sometimes. Um, I didn't. I mean, I, I chose these figures uh, because it is concentrated on um, developing uh, the developing region all over the world. Is um, if I mean I. I know very few about microcredit and microfinancing in Europe, but as far as I know, there are some initiatives, especially initiatives that could be good research, uh, research topic for Thais, uh, especially initiatives for uh, migrant women. There are, some few in, there, are few, there are some initiatives promoting uh, even informal initiatives as far as I know. No, that would be good because, uh, for instance, in our in the in the rice project, mm -hmm. uh, what uh, what the action research units are supposed to do is to support some initiatives in favor of the integration of uh, of um, vulnerable groups. So, for instance, in UCM where Thais is in Madrid, mm -hmm. their ties their uh, their pilot is about supporting sub-Saharan women. Uh, to become mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. So, so the, if, if, if there were some uh, microfinancing institution that could be part, a small part of that. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I, I think it will be crucial to, to have such initiatives for, um, in, in order to help women, women, migrant, migrant women integration in Europe. I mean, sometimes they have, they have simple lack of financing. So, Giving them financing could could help them in, in the integration process, or in have a uh, in, in have better job opportunity. Of course, always coupled with uh, uh, with uh, training and etc. 
Okay, so if there are no other questions from uh, the participants, the other two participants, I uh, I would like to thank you very much. This uh, and uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much, and I I thank you for inviting me and other colleagues pleasure. from Lorental and other universities in, in your initiatives. Thank you very much. Uh,